Well, good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that you joined us tonight for um, a presentation by Tim Weiner of uh, his new book, uh, Enemies, A History of the FBI. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that this very second. What I'm going to say instead is that although this is a tremendously wonderful event, um, the penultimate event of February, um, March is going to be a truly fantastic month. And some of you have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. You know, Crosby, Kemper, and I will never rest until all of you uh, make uh, a library public event uh, on your calendar at least once a week. And uh, in March, I think we've made that almost impossible for you not to do so. A week from today, um, a good friend of mine, uh, a, a veteran White House correspondent, uh, Carl Cannon, uh, inaugurates, as it were, um, our new series that we're doing with the Truman Library Institute called Beyond the Gowns, First Ladies in American History. And uh, he'll be providing an original riff on Michelle Obama. Um, it promises to be a really tremendous talk, so I really, really recommend that you come out for that. That's a week from today, right here in the Plaza Branch Truman Forum. And then a week after that, Pulitzer Prize winner Hedrick Smith, you may remember him as being the author of The Russians and The New Russians, um, he'll be talking about um, his new book, uh, Who Stole the American Dream? Um, the day after that, back here in the Truman Forum, uh, David Vandrelli, um, correspondent for Time Magazine, who actually lives here in Kansas City, will be joining us for uh, the continuation of our Hail to the Chiefs presidential series. He'll be talking about his new book about Lincoln. Um, and then uh, two weeks after that, um, dear, dear friend of mine, um, some of you may remember he was here five years ago. It's been five years um, uh, a guy named Rudy Maxa, the savvy traveler of National Public Radio fame and, and other places. Um, he'll be giving you tips and pointers on how to be a savvy traveler in 2013. So March is going to be great, but tonight is going to be fantastic. Um, I'm going to depart from my usual uh, uh, process of doing the introduction because um, this program tonight was not my idea. The program tonight was the idea of the assistant director of the Department of Public Affairs, a gentleman I think some of you know uh, named Steve Woolfolk. Um, it was Steve who was the champion of this idea, who brought it to my attention, who kept on saying, we've got to get this guy. This book is tremendous. And so, of course, uh, I agreed. And uh, the book is tremendous. And to tell you more about Tim and uh, Enemies, uh, please welcome Steve Woolfolk. Wow, they say you never want to be the man that follows the legend, and tonight I am sandwiched between two of them. So say a silent prayer for me if you would. <laughs> Good evening, and thanks for being here this evening. Um, as Henry mentioned, my name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Affairs at the Kansas City Public Library. And I have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker because back in June of 2012, I received his book as a Father's Day gift and proceeded to hound Henry for the next three months, telling him how great the book is and how much we had to uh, get the author to Kansas City. And tonight, he's here. As a correspondent for the New York Times, Tim Weiner covered the Central Intelligence Agency, as well as terrorism in Afghanistan and Pakistan, winning, winning a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. He is also the author of Legacy of Ashes, the History of the CIA, which won a National Book Award. Tonight he's here to talk about his latest book, Enemies, A History of the FBI. And when we think of the FBI, I think many of us probably think of a, a police force of sorts. But the FBI has always been one of America's greatest assets when it comes to intelligence gathering. And Enemies is the first definitive history of the FBI's role in intel as an intelligence agency. It's a terrific read. It's interesting, intriguing, thought-provoking, and maybe a little bit depressing. Uh, Tim does a really doesn't try to draw conclusions. As any good journalist was, he simply lays out the facts and lets the readers decide what to make of them. My takeaway was this. Many today remember J. Edgar Hoover as a power-hungry tyrant of sorts. He fought hard against the creation of the CIA. He wanted desperately to keep intelligence gathering centralized under the purview of the FBI. But fast forward to September 11th, 2001, and you have to wonder if for all his faults, he wasn't right about that. As America was reeling from the worst terrorist attack in our nation's history, 
Our various intelligence gathering agencies were pointing fingers at one another, and we were left wondering exactly who knew what and when. I really cannot recommend this book highly enough. Of particular interest to many in this audience will be a fantastic section that deals with President Truman's dealings with Hoover and the FBI. Enemies is available for sale right outside, courtesy of our friends from Reading Reptile, which also have his first book on the CIA out there as well. Tim will be happy to sign copies following the event. But now, please join me in welcoming the author of one of my favorite books of 2012, Tim Weiner. Good evening, and thank you for being here. Um, it's a thrill for me to be back here. I started out as a cub reporter at the Kansas City Times in 1981. Um, I love this town. And I knew that you would all be here, despite the blizzards and the fireballs and the thunder snow. Uh, uh, during my first year here was 113 degrees in the summer and 17 below in the winter, and everybody showed up. So I had faith. Um, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, um, and we are, in fact, going to talk about uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Harry S. Truman. Uh, we're also going to explode some myths uh, about the CIA and about the United States and about some presidents with some cold, hard facts. Uh, those of you who know uh, the life and times of Harry Truman probably think that the Cold War started in 1947, not J. Edgar Hoover's Cold War. J. Edgar Hoover's Cold War started in 1919, uh, in the fall, when during a tumultuous week uh, in September of 1919, the Communist Party of the United States was formed in Chicago. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was then a 24-year-old uh, senior employee of the Justice Department and the head of what they called the Radical Division at the Justice Department. Yes, he was 24. Uh, and during that week when the Communist Party of the United States was set up, Hoover had five guys there in the room, one of whom spoke Russian. He believed, and he believed all his life, from before he took over the FBI in 1924 at the age of 29. And for the next 48 years, until the day he died, 48 years as director of the FBI, he believed that Soviet communism was like the Spanish influenza that rose up from the killing fields in World War I and floated like a toxic cloud up from old Europe over the Atlantic and that it would descend like the Spanish influenza on the United States and kill us. That was no metaphor to him. The FBI was set up in 1908 by Teddy Roosevelt. He did it by sleight of hand. Teddy Roosevelt was a president who, as Mark Twain said, would kick the Constitution into the gutter if it served his purposes. I mean, this was the guy who carved the Panama Canal without asking the Panamanians. <clears throat> And uh, Teddy Roosevelt had become president in 1901 at the age of 42, younger than John F. Kennedy, when an assassin killed the president of the United States, William McKinley, an anarchist assassin. Anarchists had been killing kings and queens and dukes and princes all over Europe in the 1880s and the 1890s. And in 1901, they killed the president of the United States. So Teddy Roosevelt, toward the end of his presidency, determined that the United States needed a federal law enforcement agency. And there was one top reason. Yes, he wanted to curb corru corruption in Congress. And yes, he wanted to control what he called the malefactors of great wealth on Wall Street. But first and foremost, he wanted to crush anarchy in the United States before anarchists blew up Washington and killed another president. The trouble was, of course, that Congress didn't go along because TR also wanted to stop corruption in Congress. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They said, if we do this, we're going to have a secret police like they have in Tsarist Russia. And this we will not do. So Teddy Roosevelt, being Teddy Roosevelt, <clears throat> 
went to his attorney general, whose name was Charles Bonaparte. <laughs> That's right. He was the great nephew of the Emperor Napoleon, a real blue blood. And TR and Bonaparte got together and figured out that they were going to just kind of pull a fast one on Congress. And they slipped a paragraph into the budget bill for the Justice Department for the coming year. And before Congress knew it, there was an FBI. The FBI was a small, weak, uh, and not terribly efficient organization made up of uh, private eyes, washed up Secret Service agents, uh, until World War I. Uh, and just as the first American troops were landing in France in 1917, uh, including, if I've got this right, Harry Truman, um, J. Edgar Hoover joined the Justice Department, 22 years old, with a night degree from law, uh, law school. And Woodrow Wilson uh, forced through Congress in those early months of the American entry into World War I in 1917 a number of extraordinary laws, some of which survive today. Among them, something called the Espionage Act of 1917, which made it illegal to say, print, uh, or uh, advocate anything against the government of the United States, its foreign policies, or to have ideas, publish ideas, or speak in favor of the uh, alteration or abolition of our form of government. As World War I ended, the Russian Revolution began to bubble up. And by 1919, uh, the threat was apparent to people like J. Edgar Hoover. On his 25th birthday, New Year's Day, 1920, Hoover, 25 years old, as chief of the radical division of the Justice Department, organized the FBI into what is still the biggest counterterrorism dragnet in the history of the United States. At least 6,000 people, probably more like nine or 10,000 people, were pulled out of bed, pulled out of hotels, pulled out of restaurants, uh, pulled out of their offices, uh, without warrants, arrested, and thrown in prison or jail to await trial or deportation. These were known at the time as, as the Palmer Raids after Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, who was gearing up to run for president. 95% of these arrests were thrown out because they were illegal. They were done without warrants. They were unconstitutional. About 500 of them stood. J. Edgar Hoover organized these raids, planned them, executed them, but when <clears throat> they went bad, a. Mitchell Palmer took the hit. <laughs> the FBI in the early 1920s during the sordid administration of President Harding became a corrupt, vicious organization uh, run by crooked cops and uh, extortionist private eyes. <clears throat> And by the end of the Harding administration, which ended when President Harding basically died of embarrassment, in 1923, uh, members of his cabinet were indicted, included, including his attorney general, who oversaw the FBI. And with the new administration in 1924, run by President Coolidge, who was a very straight arrow, <clears throat> although incredibly conservative, uh, when the Boston police went out on strike uh, when he was governor of Massachusetts a few years earlier, he arrested the police. <laughs> Tough guy. So they were casting about for a new head of the FBI because the old head of the FBI was about to be arrested and indicted. President Coolidge had named a pillar of the law, Harlan Fisk Stone, as Attorney General, later the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And Stone looked around the Justice Department, which stank of corruption. <clears throat> and he looked down. Harlan Stone stood about six and a half feet tall. He looked down at J. Edgar Hoover, who was about a foot shorter. 
And he said, Edgar, I'm going to name you the acting director of the FBI on one condition. These techniques that the FBI has been using, wiretapping, bugging with hidden microphones, breaking and entering, known in the trade as black bag jobs because the lock pickers and burglars of the FBI carried their tools in a doctor's little black bag. That has to stop. No more of that. We're taking away your hunting license. The FBI was and is today primarily not a law enforcement agency. Anybody can catch a bank robber or a car thief. It is an intelligence organization. And its job was and is to stop anarchists, terrorists, and people who wanted to blow up the people and the symbols of power of the United States before they lit the fuse. There had been a number of terrorist bombings in 1919, 1920. You can still go down in Wall Street to the corner of Wall and Broad Street and see the scars on the House of Morgan and the cornerstone, the shrapnel cut into the stone. 44 people died. Hundreds were injured by an anarchist bomb in 1920. The FBI investigated but never caught the people who did it. Anyway, Attorney General Stone looked down on young J. Edgar Hoover, 29 years old, and said, no more of that. Your job is to enforce the law. No more bugging, no more breaking and entering, no more wiretapping, no more breaking the law to uphold the Constitution. And Mr. Hoover looked up and said, yes, sir. We're going to fast forward about a decade. It's 1936. Hoover's been running the FBI for 12 years. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is president. And the FBI has gained fame and honor, mostly from Hollywood movies. Don't shoot, G-Man. Um, that publicity campaign was uh, the job of the, the Attorney General, Roosevelt's first Attorney General. But he couldn't be the leader of the war on crime. He looked like a librarian, no offense. Um, so, but Hoover looked like a bulldog. So he became the public face of the war on crime, as they called it back then. Hoover wasn't interested in any of that. Although the publicity was good and the money it generated from Congress was good, he was interested in communists, anarchists, and terrorists. And so, by 1936, was the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And Roosevelt, uh, at the end of his first term, called Hoover in. They had a one-on-one. -on -one. It was Hoover's first one-on-one -on -one with the president. They both took good notes. Both sets of notes survive. Uh, and the president of the United States said, Edgar, I want you to develop a very clear picture of communism and fascism in the United States. Now remember, it's 1936. Joe Stalin is on the rise. Adolf Hitler is on the rise. It's not clear who's going to win. There are about, in 1936, in the depths of the Great Depression, about 80,000 card-carrying members of the Communist Party of the United States. There are at least 10 times that number of fascists, card-carrying members of fascist parties in the United States, who are marching around the streets with swastikas and silver shirts and lightning bolts. Uh, and uh, Hoover said, yes, sir, I can do that but I need to use the techniques that are traditional in this field, wiretapping, bugging. <laughs> and the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, loved that. He said, you go right ahead, Edgar. Roosevelt had been Under Secretary of the Navy during and after World War I. And the Naval Investigative Service and the FBI used to love breaking into foreign embassies and stealing their code books. And FDR had said back then in 1919, if the people of the United States knew what we'd done during the war, we'd all go to prison for 999 years, quote unquote. Anyway, this was catnip for F FDR. So Hoover went ahead. He was not that interested in investigating fascism in the United States, but he was deeply interested in investigating communism in the United States, his stock and trade, as it had been since 1919. 
Things went swimmingly until the Supreme Court of the United States, by a nine to nothing vote, banned wiretapping in the United States in 1939. What happened next proves that Hoover was the greatest bureaucrat of the 20th century. What did he do? The Supreme Court is taking away his hunting license. Does he call a press conference? Does he write an embittered editorial and put it in the New York Times? No. He pulses the system of the FBI and learns that there's a, uh, it's slowly developing like a piece of film, the beginnings of an investigation into money laundering by German agents in the United States who are trying to influence the 1940 election by supporting, for example, Father Coughlin, the famous uh, anti-Semitic radio preacher, and Charles Lindbergh, who was basically a fascist. Uh, and a leading candidate for the 1940 nomination for the President of the United States. Does Hoover go to the press? No, he goes to the Secretary of the Treasury, Hans Morgenthal, who is, among other things, a German Jew, the head of the banking system of the United States, and intensely interested in Nazi sabotage. It's the fall of 1939. Hitler has invaded Poland. World War II is on. And Hoover says to Hans Morgenthau, Mr. Secretary, there are Nazi spies in this country who are laundering money trying to influence the 1940 election. But what can I do? The Supreme Court has taken away my strongest tool. Morgenthau picks up the phone and calls the president. The next day, Roosevelt, in writing, Roosevelt didn't put a lot of things in writing like this, wrote a one-page letter that said, Dear Edgar, in essence, Screw the Supreme Court. I want you to go right on what you've been doing against the enemies of the United States in the name of national security. Hoover took this letter, put it in the top drawer of his desk, and it stayed there for the next quarter of a century. The only person to question it during the 1940s was Harry Truman. As you know, President Roosevelt died suddenly in April 1945, shortly before the end of World War II. And Harry Truman said, famously, he felt as if the sun and the moon and the stars had fallen on him. Harry Truman had not been, as it were, read in to the secrets of the United States government at this point. He didn't know anything about the program to build the atomic bomb. He further didn't know that there was an active FBI, FBI investigation into spies and the Manhattan Project who were trying to steal the secrets of the atomic bomb. Harry Truman basically, when he became president, didn't know his rear end from third base about the secrets of the United States. But he began to learn slowly in the spring and the summer of 1945. And among the people who tried to school him 10 days into his presidency was J. Edgar Hoover. And they met on April 23rd, 1945. Hoover made a bad impression on the president. He began trying to tell Truman about the secret world of the FBI. Um, and Hoover sort of uh, leaned in and President Truman recoiled and immediately called his uh, military aide, Harry Vaughn, in the United States, Vaughn was one of his closest friends. They served together in World War I. Uh, and he picked Vaughn as his personal military aide, and he made him an instant brigadier general, one-star general. And Truman said to Hoover, listen, this is Harry Vaughn. He's my military aide. You have something dirty, dangerous, and difficult to say about this? Tell it to Harry Vaughn. And he left the room. Well, Hoover had an incredible talent that he developed under Roosevelt and that he used with every new president for the next 25 years of winning their favor by telling them dirty little secrets. Not about espionage, but about who in Congress was an alcoholic, who was a secret homosexual, who slept with prostitutes. Hoover was already sort of the national superego looking down and ruling by fear and secrecy. Well, Harry Vaughn and Hoover liked each other. They got along. So Hoover 
they drank bourbon, they told barnyard jokes, and director Hoover shared his intimate knowledge about the personal lives of President Roosevelt's inner circle. Harry Truman didn't know who to trust. And Hoover said, listen, uh, the Attorney General of the United States is trying to stab you in the back, Mr. President, he told Harry Vaughn. And he gave Vaughn transcripts of wiretap conversations of members of the cabinet, senators, and congressmen who seemed to be conspiring against the new president. And Vaughn recounted in an oral history that's in the Truman Library in Independence. He said, what the hell is this? And Hoover said, this is a wiretap on so-and-so. I'm quoting from the oral history. And Harry told me, the president, what the hell is that crap? And I said, that's a wiretap. And he said, President Truman said, cut all of them off. Tell the FBI we haven't got time for that kind of shit. But President Truman would find the time. Hoover sensed from the beginning of the Truman administration that he, Hoover, could be proclaimed by public opinion and by Congress the leader of the American war on communism. And the Cold War began in full. The Cold, not Hoover's Cold War, our Cold War. Shortly thereafter, out of Westminster College, uh, in Fulton in 1946, Winston Churchill came to talk and he said, as you'll remember, that an iron curtain was descending on Europe and that Soviet com communism was going to worm its pernicious way into the government of the United States if we didn't watch out. Harry Truman didn't believe that yet. Edgar Hoover did. In 1947, President Truman, Truman proclaimed the Truman Doctrine Communism was on the rise in Greece, Turkey, and the communists might th were threatening to win power in France and in Italy, not by bullets, but at the ballot box. The crucial break came at the beginning of the 80th Congress in March 1947. That Congress was the most conservative Congress of the 20th century. The Republicans had run on anti-communist platform. The freshman members include Congressman Richard Nixon, Joe McCarthy, and others of that stripe. And Mr. Hoover went down to Capitol Hill, which he rarely did in public in March 1947, at the beginning of the 80th Congress. And he gave a speech to the newly formed House Committee on Un-American Activities. He broke with the President of the United States. He broke with Harry Truman. And he said, communism is not a political party. It is a way of life, a malignant and evil way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting the nation. Harry Truman didn't buy that yet. And he wouldn't buy it until the Korean War broke out. It wasn't until 1951 that he said to the American people that he feared, as Hoover did, that Soviet communism was burrowing its way into the United States, into the government of the United States, and the American people were at risk from this pernicious and deadly ideology. Well, in fact, there were Soviet spies in America. Julius Rosenberg was a communist spy. He was guilty as hell. Alger Hiss was a communist spy. He was guilty as hell. Klaus Fuchs who was a German physicist who had been sent by British intelligence to work on the Manhattan Project to build the bomb, who was a communist spy. He was guilty as hell. The Hoover had investigated all these cases, but because his methodologies were illegal, because they relied on bugging and wiretapping and code breaking and espionage, 
These cases could not be brought in public, so they had to be brought in Congress. The argument over who was going to run the United States was a very close call. Harry Truman eventually lost that argument. When Dwight Eisenhower and Vice President Richard Nixon took power in 1953, Hoover rose to the height of his powers. Because President Eisenhower believed, and Richard Nixon believed, with all his heart, that the FBI had to lead the war on communism in the United States. Hoover took that lead, and he ran. Hoover addressed President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, and the members of the National Security Council in a secret meeting in the White House in 1956. What well, was secret at the time? We have the transcript now. He raised two issues. He raised the specter that the Soviets could put a dirty bomb of cobalt-60 radioactive isotope that was newly being used to try and fight cancer, could a, brief, a briefcase bomb in the middle of New York City full of cobalt-60 that could kill hundreds of thousands of people. He also raised the specter, which is based on his informants. The FBI had informants in every walk of life in the universities, in the government, and in the Communist Party of the United States. He raised the specter that the newly rising civil rights movement in this country, that aimed to end segregation and give a seventh of our nation, black people, equal rights under law, was being run by Soviet Russia. President Eisenhower bought this, so did Richard Nixon. And the FBI began to become a political force in America stronger than it had ever been at any time that fought not Soviet spies only, but Americans who weren't communists, who weren't socialists, but who wanted to alter the government of the United States and its policies, who wanted some form of control on nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons tests, who wanted equal rights for black people, who wanted equal rights for women, who wanted equal rights for homosexuals. These people started marching in the streets in the 1950s, and the FBI went after them hammer and tong. They destroyed people. I think some of you may remember this. Maybe you had friends in college in the 1950s, the early 1960s whose careers were ruined. Hundreds of thousands of people fell under the influence of the FBI's espionage against Americans. Many of their lives were destroyed. Among the people <clears throat> that Hoover targeted with the absolute full approval of President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, President Kennedy, and his 35-year-old brother, the Attorney General of the United States, Bobby Kennedy, was Martin Luther King. Hoover had an informant, a really good informant, who had been a member of the Communist Party in the 1930s and early 1940s, and who in the late 1950s re-entered the party, became its foreign secretary, working for the FBI. His name was Morris Childs, codenamed Solo. Morris re-entered the party, while being an informant for the FBI, became its foreign secretary, the number two man in the Communist Party of the United States, and beginning in 1958, was sent by the CPUSA to Moscow, to Beijing. He met with Khrushchev. He met with Mao Zedong. He went back to meet with all the members of the Soviet Politburo who were like, Morris, Tovarish, friend. Let me tell you what's going on. And Morris Childs came back, and luckily for the purposes of my book, his uh, debriefings began to be declassified about a year ago. They made it into the book, and they're extraordinary. 
And one of the things that Morris Childs told <clears throat> J. Edgar Hoover, who then told President Kennedy and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, was that Martha Lu Martin Luther King's closest advisor was a white New York Jew named Stanley Levison, had been in the 19 member, 1950s a member not of the Communist Party of the United States, but of the Soviet espionage underground in this country. It was true but then made the leap that therefore Martin Luther King was a pawn of Soviet communism. President Kennedy and Attorney General Kennedy, who was on paper J. Edgar Hoover's boss, lived in fear of Hoover for many reasons. Among them was the fact, which President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy knew perfectly well, that 20 years before, in 1942, the FBI had been following a suspected Nazi spy, a beautiful 26-year-old woman named Inga Arvad, who had been, among other things, Adolf Hitler's publicist at the 1936 Olympics, and was, in 1942, uh, a columnist for uh, the most conservative paper in Washington, married, and one fine weekend, in the fall of 1942, took a train down to Newport News, Virginia. The FBI followed her. She checked into a hotel. The FBI bugged the room. She spent a very pleasurable weekend with a young Navy lieutenant, junior grade, named John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Jr. I've seen the transcript. It's got everything but the bed springs creaking. <laughs> and J. Edgar Hoover went to President, uh, young John Kennedy's father, Ambassador Joe Kennedy, and said, naughty, naughty. Don't sleep with suspected Nazi spies. Tell your son. President Kennedy knew that that transcript was sitting there at the FBI. Bobby Kennedy knew it. The fear was tantamount to blackmail. So when J. Edgar Hoover went to President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and said, look, Martin Luther King is an agent of Soviet Russia, which was not true, they could not contradict him. They could not gainsay this. And so Bobby Kennedy signed a wiretap order. Bobby Kennedy denied doing this until the day of his death. For 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 day a year, surveillance of Martin Luther King. His home, his offices, the hotels he stayed in. And after a couple of years of this, it finally produced this coverage. This is after President Kennedy's death. After Bobby Kennedy, at the time, in fact, it was almost the same week that Bobby Kennedy resigned as Attorney General to run uh, for the Senate. This produced what we would today call a sex tape of Martin Luther King in the Willard Hotel in Washington having sexual congress with someone who was not his wife. Hoover tried to peddle this all over Washington. Every newspaper, senators, congressmen, nobody would touch it. Times have changed. Ask David Petraeus. Yes. Lyndon Johnson had been J. Edgar Hoover's next door neighbor for 15 years. He loved J. Edgar Hoover. In the 1950s, when, when uh, Lyndon Johnson was a senator, he bought a beagle for his two daughters. They named it Edgar. <laughs> That's how close. They used to drink together. They barbecue steaks in the backyard. They were, they were cronies. They were not friends, technically. Jed Groover never really had friends. But they worked together, and Lyndon Johnson knew what Jed Groover could do for him. Lyndon Johnson wanted two things out of J. Edgar Hoover when he was running for president in 1964. He wanted intense coverage of the left in the United States. This he knew Hoover could do. But he also was going to run for president in his own right in the summer of 1964. To be elected, Lyndon Johnson, a conservative southerner, needed to win the South. To win the South, he needed the black vote, and blacks didn't have the right to vote. He needed to pass the Voting Rights Act. He needed the votes of Southern senators. In order to do that, he needed to crush the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan, lest we forget, was the most murderous terrorist organization in the history of the United States. The Klan killed thousands of people in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, and they ruled the South. 
by fear and force. They ruled the county sheriffs. They ruled members of Congress. They ruled the judges. And Lyndon Johnson called J. Edgar Hoover. And this is all on tape. Johnson taped his telephone calls. It's in the Lyndon Johnson Library. You can listen to it online. It'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And the President of the United States said, Edgar, I want you to do to the Ku Klux Klan what you've done to the communists. I want you to gather all the intelligence you can get on the Klan. Hoover didn't want to do that. He thought the problem in the 60s wasn't the segregationists, what he called the integrationists. Hoover was a hater. He hated blacks. He hated Jews. He hated liberals. And when you were on his hate list, you were on it for life. So Hoover hemmed and hawed for a minute or two, but he did it. And in two years, the Klan was crushed like a dry twig, broken, through wiretapping, through breaking and entering, through bugging, through blackmail, through fear. The power that this man had, no unelected person in the history of the United States has ever had that kind of power. And what was the source of his power? The source of his power was intelligence, secret information. We know information is power. Secret information is power squared. And secret intelligence that you and only you can deliver to the President of the United States, that's power cubed. Nobody knew this better than Richard Nixon. Nixon had watched Hoover when Nixon was Vice President. Nixon had worked with Hoover when he was in Congress in the Senate, going back to 1947. Nixon, in his memoir, called J. Edgar Hoover, quote, my closest personal friend in all of public life. Well, Nixon didn't really have friends either. <laughs> he liked to be alone in the White House, brooding. But Nixon and Hoover were, the two of them, the most powerful leaders of anti-communism in the United States throughout the 20th century. They understood each other. Nixon knew how Hoover worked. He knew, because he had been read into this as vice president, that the most powerful tools Nixon ha that Hoover had were wiretapping, bugging, black bag jobs, and blackmail. And Lyndon Johnson told Nixon during the transition, when Nixon was president-elect, and he said, and I quote, Dick, If it hadn't been, this is all on tape too. If it hadn't been for Edgar Hoover, I couldn't carry out my responsibilities as commander in chief, period. Dick, you will come to depend on Edgar. He is a pillar of strength in a city of weak men. Nixon knew this. And he also knew something that Lyndon Johnson had told him, which is, you will rely on Hoover. I'm quoting again from a conversation between Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. You will rely on Hoover time and again to maintain security. He's the only one you can put your complete trust in. Nixon had a soaring vision when he came to office. He wanted peace in our time. He wanted, as his campaign slogan was, to bring us together. But his policies for doing this relied on secret diplomacy, secret plans, and secret intelligence. And he did depend on Hoover. The ship of state, as they say, is the only ship that leaks from the top. And the Nixon White House leaked from day one. Nixon wanted to invade Cambodia. It's on the front page of the New York Times next week. Nixon wanted to do a secret bombing run and the Vietnam War was on the front page of the New York Times the next month. He was furious. And Hoover told him, I can fix this for you. And Nixon said, good. Tap the members of the National Security Council staff who I think are leaking and tap the reporters that I think they're leaking too. 
this Hoover did. And the taps produced over the course of the next year what President Nixon called, this is on tape two, just hours and hours and hours of bullshitting. They never found the leakers. They never got the information. But these transcripts sat there festering in the FBI, completely illegal, totally warrantless. Nixon pressed harder. And he told Hoover in 1970, now let's remember back then, you and I were young back then in 1970, but we remember, this country was being torn apart by the war in Vietnam. There were riots, there were shootings. But the FBI, Hoover's FBI, at this point couldn't tell the kid with a picket sign from the kid with a Molotov cocktail. They just didn't know the difference. Nixon pressed harder and harder and harder, and he ordered Hoover to tear down the walls, as it were, between the FBI and the CIA and the National Security Agency, which is the foreign intelligence agency, military agency responsible for electronic eavesdropping overseas. No more, wa no more restrictions on gathering intelligence in this country. Spy the hell out of Americans. Use all the techniques that you would use against the communists during the Cold War, against American citizens. To hell with the law, to hell with the Supreme Court. Are we seeing a pattern here? To hell with oversight in Congress. And Hoover said no. He was getting old. He was 75. He was getting scared. He felt, he knew, that the geotectonic plates of the politics of the United States were shifting to the left. And he said, no, this I will not do, because he was afraid he was going to get caught, and that his honor and the reputation of the FBI would be stained forever. Nixon was furious. And what did he do when Hoover said no? He set up his own little shop, didn't he, of former FBI agents and former CIA officers and agents, not just to plug the leaks, but to spy on Americans, as Hoover had spied on Americans in the 40s and 50s and 60s. They called this outfit the Plumbers, because they were originally going to stop the leaks, weren't they? <clears throat> When Hoover said no, Nixon cut him off. No more phone calls. No more dinners at the White House. No more drinks on the presidential yacht. Cut him off. And Hoover died alone and fearful on the 2nd of May, 1972. And six weeks later, the plumbers were caught breaking into the Democratic Party headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. Never would have happened if Hoover had lived. Never would have happened if Hoover was still the leader of the war. And Nixon fell. In his last de desperate attempt to control the mechanisms of wiretapping, bugging, and espionage in this country, he appointed a stooge to succeed Hoover named Pat Gray. The guy who was Hoover's rightful successor, the number two guy at the FBI, who had been a young agent for the FBI here in Kansas City, was a fellow named Mark Felt. Ring a bell? Yes. Deep throat. In the fullness of time, Gray and Felt and Miller, who had done the president's bidding after Hoover died, would be indicted by a federal grand jury for conspiring to violate the civil rights of Americans, for breaking into their homes, tapping their phones, the burglars of the Watergate were caught on the weekend of September, uh, sorry, June 17th and 18th, 1972. On the 19th, the following day in June, the Monday, the Supreme Court of the United States outlawed warrantless wiretapping in the United States. And under this law, Hoover's putative successor, Gray, his would-be successor, Felt, Mark Felt, and Miller would be indicted. And the guy that Richard Nixon selected to clean up this mess 
was the police chief of Kansas City, Missouri, Clarence Kelly. Anybody remember Clarence Kelly here? Nice guy. A little bit over his head. Clarence Kelly, the poor, poor guy, took over in 1973. Nixon flew out here to Kansas City in the summer of 1973. Anybody remember that? That was pretty weird. Nixon was under siege. He looked terrible. Clarence Kelly noted how terrible he looked, and he wondered what was plaguing the president. Was he sick? Did he have some terrible secret? He was right the second time. Kelly fought what he thought was the good fight as Nixon fell, to preserve the powers of the FBI, to spy on Americans, to wiretap without a warrant, to break into your homes in the name of national security. Because when the president or the head of the FBI takes the oath of office, he swears to do two things, to protect and defend the United States and the Constitution. Sometimes these are two opposing forces, national security and civil liberties. They are at war. We want to be safe. We want to be free. We have to be both. But these are opposing forces. And the tug of war that has taken place for the last 237 years was never more intense than it was then, in the 1970s. Director Kelly feared that the FBI itself would be destroyed during and after Watergate, when the Senate and the House began to investigate what the FBI and the CIA had been doing in our names, in the name of national security. Clarence Kelly went, it was May 8th, 1976, our bicentennial year, back to Westminster College over in Fulton, where Winston Churchill had given the Iron Curtain speech. 30 years before. And he acknowledged for the first time that the FBI had done things that were indefensible. And he said they would never be repeated. The speech instantly became known in the Bureau as the I'm sorry speech. Kelly never held power or moral suasion over the Bureau again. He had to quit in frustration uh, during the Carter administration. And the problem was that nobody wanted to do this work anymore at the FBI. They didn't want to break the law in the name of upholding national security. A new generation, Hoover's FBI and the FBI in the, in the you know, throughout the 70s, was 99.94% white, 100% male, mostly Irish and Italian. That's why they didn't get it. They didn't get what was happening in this country in the 60s and 70s. And the FBI had to change or die. And it almost died in the 1980s and the 1990s because nobody wanted to do this anymore. Nobody wanted to figure out how you could do espionage in this country, spy on people, wiretap, under law. It was just too hard. The FBI and the CIA, another of Hoover's legacy, were constantly at each other's throats. As the Cold War came to a close and a new era of, we thought, enduring peace was established in the 1990s, these guys couldn't get along, the FBI and the CIA. Hoover hated the CIA, hated them with an enduring passion because he wanted to be the chief of worldwide intelligence in this country, and Harry Truman said no. It got so bad by the end of the 1990s that the FBI was penetrated to the marrow of its bones by Russian spies, by Chinese spies, and even briefly by a guy who was working for Al-Qaeda. The present director of the FBI, who was a very good guy, I don't think one American in a hundred knows his name, Robert S. Mueller III, known to his agents as Bobby Three Sticks. 
took over as director of the FBI, the sixth director in the 100-year history of the FBI. God help him on September the 4th, 2001. And what happened over the next couple of years is a lesson for us all. And it's a note on which I'm going to close. The President of the United States, George W. Bush, did what Nixon had intended to do in the 1970s, to tear down the walls, as it were, between American intelligence agencies and to spy in this country against Americans without a warrant from a judge. This is what Nixon had wanted to do, but he never got it done because Hoover said no. It took almost exactly two and a half years after Bob Mueller was sworn in before Mueller figured out what was going on. The president had turned the National Security Agency, which is supposed to spy on people overseas using electronic eavesdropping, tap computers, tap telecommunications, read emails, was spying in this country against Americans without a judicial warrant. Nobody in the Justice Department knew about this, and the head of the FBI didn't know about it either. It was that secret. It was that illegal. It was illegal as hell. And when the head of the FBI and the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General finally figured out what was going on at the beginning of 2004, Mueller, the head of the FBI, had the courage and the integrity to go and confront the President of the United States one-on-one -on -one in the Oval Office in March 2004. How do we know what happened? Mueller took good notes. They've been declassified. I've got them. Bush told almost exactly the same story in his memoir because he was mousetrapped because of Mueller's notes. He knew what Mueller knew. And Mueller said, Mr. President, this program of spying on Americans that you have started is illegal as hell. It is unconstitutional. And unless you cut it back and bring it within the delimitations of the law, I am going to resign. And the Attorney General is going to resign, and his deputy is going to resign. What flashed through Bush's mind? The Saturday Night Massacre. Richard Nixon. Bush knew that if the FBI director resigned, what would be the headline the next day? FBI director resigns, won't say why. Secrecy is cited. What is the next question at the next press conference, assuming Bush would have had the courage to have a press conference at that point? Mr. President, what are you doing that is so illegal and dangerous and secret that the FBI director and the Attorney General have resigned? Bush knew that he had to do what the FBI director was insisting. It took the American people two and a half years to find out what happened. But Bush cut it back. Now that is power. And that is power under law. Mueller has been there for 12 years now. He has served longer than any FBI director since J. Edgar Hoover. Obama kept him on past his legal 10-year term, a 10-year term that was instituted after Hoover died, of course. He's still there. And I believe that after more than 100 years in this tug of war that our framers created intentionally the framers of the Constitution, between security and liberty. And for the first time in more than 100 years, they're trying to get it right. <coughs> yes, I know the Supreme Court yesterday ruled five to four that the government can do whatever it wants in this realm in the name of national security. And yes, we can talk about illegal eavesdropping. And yes, the FBI has overstepped its bounds. But when they do it now, they will confess error. Mueller has said that when he retires, which he will do this summer, he doesn't want to be the guy who, when he retires, they hang a medal around his neck and say, congratulations, you won the war on terror, but we lost our civil liberties. This is a struggle. It's been going on since 1776. Harry Truman knew it was a struggle. The President of the United States today knows it's a struggle. As long as we know what the government is doing in its name, this balance, this struggle, 
between security and liberty will not end. As long as it goes on, we can stay a free republic. No free republic in the history of civilization has lasted longer than 300 years. We've got 63 years to go. Good luck.